long enough to, to recall and recount epochs of history. I, I can't do maybe what Mama Fien could do, who probably has me about a few years, but I, I remember years and changes in his history. Now, I don't think there's anybody here. If you were alive during the 30s, then you, you, were, then you were alive during the Great Depression. Is there anybody here who was alive during the 30s? Just one, just one, two. So you may not remember the Depression because you were very young. But they were, they were, they, my mother was born right at the beginning of the Great Depression. If she were alive, she'd be 84 years of age. And so she remember epochs of, of history. Um, anyone here remember December 7th, 1941? What happened? The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Anyone remember November 22nd, 1963? Anybody remember February 1965? 1965, Malcolm X. April 4th, 1968. January, June 4th, 1968, Robert Kennedy. Dates we will never forget. And I'm old enough to remember changes in, in times and seasons and, and highs and lows and events that have shaped our character, shaped our historical perspective. But I, have, I do not remember a time quite like this time in which we live right now. I'm talking about this particular stretch of history. There is not necessarily a fear, but there is an angst and an anxiety and an uneasiness about this time of history that I don't think I've ever seen it quite like this before. Almost everyone that I talk to feel that they're in a time of transition between the no more and the not yet. Not where we used to be, but certainly not. But we seem to be not only between the no more and the not yet, but why are we here this long? This strange time. It is a strange time. And my, my gauge might be wrong, but I'll tell you something. I don't even seem to see that many people who have really that much joy. Look at the faces of people. I don't see a lot of joy in people's faces. Well, I see us get happy and do what we do, but look at people's faces. Study their faces, and we don't look like we're very happy. I think what is happening to a lot of us is that we, we, listen, many of us are finding joy at different points in the journey, mm -hmm. but not necessarily a joyous journey. Yeah. There's a difference. Yes, These are strange times. Yes, it is. A queasiness, a, a, something is just not quite right. In the national character, in our churches, and people seem to be in a strange, I, I, I was saying it the other day, but it's almost as if we have no hope in the future. I don't even know when we've had anybody to get married in our church. Why? For what? First of all, you say you can't find anybody. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know anything about that. But... People get married because they have hope in the future. Yes. Yes. I just might as well be single. I, I, I do hope, though, that in your single state, you're living celibate. Yes. I hope you're not involved in sexual activity because you're not supposed to. That's not what I'm teaching on, so let's just let that go. Because I think you and I both know the real answer to that, so let's don't, let's don't even go there. Why, there is a difference between hard times and bad times. Yeah. Now, these are not hard times. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that. I don't know anybody who has been set out of doors and house repossessed and car repossessed and standing in some soup line. Or 
I don't even know that many people in our church are really unemployed or, or just scraping out an existence. So these are not times like the Great Depression. These are not times, oh, but there are people who are going through hard times. There are people facing foreclosure and disease and struggles and strife and, and issues like that. But they, these are not hard times, but I think they are bad times. If I can just be, uh, I'm a bootleg historian. I'm, I'm strictly bootleg. I have no credentials to be a historian. I just, I reflect on history. A scholar study history. I reflect on history. Just as my father says, I don't make pictures. I connect the dots. But I, I often get the feel that we're living in a new dark ages. You, you go back and study uh, that period basically uh, between about um, 500 AD until about 1500 AD. And it's called the dark ages. You look that up. Now we think that because we have great technology we, we're getting by but all cable is is what you don't want to see on more channels. So much so until now, they're bringing back old stuff, me TV. I've seen more Gilligan's Island and Fred Sanford and Good Times, but I thought we were moving ahead. But to be entertained, we've got to go. So we're paying $35, $40, $100 a month to watch stuff that came on in the 60s and 70s. Who are the brilliant authors today? Who are the great theologians? Who are the great thinkers? Who are the great entertainers? I'm not talking about folk who can just shimmy and shake. I mean, who can just stand flat-footed now and entertain you without lights and camera and, and all that stuff? When was the last time you saw a truly, truly great movie? Where is the American intellect? Are we more intellectual now? Now we have all this stuff on Google and Wikipedia, but are we more intellectual now? In the most intellectual time of human history, the average school child can't write a decent sentence. And we laugh about it. Some of our children don't know the difference between T-O-T-W-O and T-O-O. And if somebody says, conversate, one more time I'm going to lose my religion. We're making up words. We've got dictionaries that tell us, you go to churches now and you see programs with mistakes on a, where is spell check? I was at a church the other day, it had on there A-L-T-E-R, altar call. Like alterations on a dress. Didn't somebody see that? This is the 21st century. And if you use a word over, six, over two syllables, oh, you think you something. Using them big words. Well, maybe we should go back to the moans and grunts of the caveman. <laughs> and young people who can't communicate now say, yo, what the devil is yo? You, you, I mean, you know, see, see, I mean, oh, hear what I mean. No, tell me what you mean. We may very well be back in the dark ages. And I said on Facebook today, I wonder if given the climate of 2014 with the civil rights bill passed today. That's another matter. I get the weird feeling we're going backwards and not forward. Well, so much for that. But this tough time, let me say this to you tonight, but I want you to know that the genius of this book is that if you allow it to, it addresses and confronts our situations. Whether they're up or down, good or bad, right or wrong, this book is a, a living book. This is the only book that's alive. It breathes, it, it walks, it talks, it listens. When you read your Bible, it'll walk with you. It will talk with you. It will comfort you when you are down. It will pull you down when you are up. It will straighten you out when you are wrong. It will keep you company at night. It will shine the light on your pathway. It will put your broken heart back together. In this book we have the very spirit of God himself. 
in this book, as one preacher said, we have the footprints of God, the, the mind of God. And, and whatever the situation is, hard times, bad times, this book speaks to us. So let's, with that in mind, let's look at the 61st Psalm and let's, and let's see what's going on here. Read. Hear my cry, O God. Hear my cry, O God. Stop. This is David. Uh -huh. This is David. Now listen, I think we should listen to David. This man knows something about trouble. He knows something about difficulty. He knows something about hard times. The poor boy was a teenager keeping his father's sheep. Samuel shows up and anoints him king and all hell breaks loose. He goes and he kills Goliath so the king gets jealous and spends years chasing him, trying to kill him. Even gave him his daughter to try to kill him. Years he spends running, hiding in caves, trying to escape the wrath of the king, running to the Philistines, trouble, running through the hills of Judea, trouble. For just, and then when he was anointed king of Israel, he had to be anointed three times before he could be in his rightful place. First anointed by Saul, then anointed for seven years at king in Hebron, and then anointed king of the whole nation. He was only king of all of Israel for 33 years. For seven years, the other nations, the other tribes did not, did not accept him or affirm him. He get to be king and he had to fight wars and the enemies of the people and there was bloodshed and war and conflict and fighting and fighting and this war and that war and this struggle and that struggle. It was a life of struggle. It was not an idyllic life. No matter how we sanitize it or try to make it look good, it was not. It was a tough life. Very difficult. And he made a mistake and God let him stay on the throne. But the sword never left his house. And his son raped his daughter. And another son tried to take him from his throne. And now he's king but still running for his life through the hills of Judea. And he watched that son die a horrible death. By the way, David was a good king but he was a bad father. That's another sermon. He was not a good father but we'll talk about that later. But this man knows something about trouble. David did not write psalms from some ivory tower. He did not sit in some cloistered room with the air conditioner blowing on his head with his laptop in front of him writing cute songs. He wrote out a pain. So when you hear David, may I suggest, listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. No ivory tower, smooth skinned, easy road, crystal stare. Not for David. Listen at him cry out. What did he say? Read. Hear my cry. Hear my cry. My what? My cry. My cry. Read. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know what? Sometimes I just think, I, I don't want to belabor this, but sometimes I think every word of Scripture ought to rest you. Sometimes your prayer is just, oh, God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, Elder is reading with dignity because she's been to college, but really there's, there's a, hear my cry. Oh, God. Yes. And sometimes you need to get to the, Oh, God. It needs to come up out of your soul. Not cute, pretty praying, but let the, whatever's in you, let it out. Hear my cry. Oh, God. As if he's the only one that can help you. The only one that can see you through. Call him like you need it. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, that's when you get the call that your child's been hit by a car. And you don't know if that child is living or not. Oh, God. When some disease is moving on your body and you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, God. He's a reward of them that diligently seek him. Read. Attend unto my prayer. Attend. I need you to listen to me. I need you to hear me. I need you to pay attention to me. You need to pray like you really mean to be praying. Don't get cute with God. Your situation is too serious. Your problems are too real. Attend to my prayer. Lord, I need you to hear me. Read. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. Ah, that's very important. From, from the extremity. Now, that doesn't mean literally. It's figurative, picturesque language. I've been pushed to the edge. I'm talking about to the edge. Is there anybody here ever felt like you've been at the edge? Listen, we like pretty scriptures. Now, the Bible says 
No, we sing, he won't put any more on you than you can bear. I know where we get that from. We get that from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, uh, uh, there's no temptation that has taken us, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow us, watch this, to be tempted or tested or tried beyond that which we are able. But, with the but God is faithful, who with the temptation will make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. Now, that's one scripture, but I have another one for you. I think it's either in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. Paul is giving his testimony. You know what Paul said? Paul said, now, when we, we, we were in, in uh, Achaia. I think it was Achaia, Ephesus. You know what he said? Watch this. He says, we were pressed beyond measure. Now, you know what that means? That means here is your measure. This is all you can take right here. But we were pressed. Uh-oh. See, that's the other side of scripture we don't want to deal with. Sometimes you get pressed. Sometimes you can't take it anymore. It's too much. And then Paul said, so that we even despaired of life. Do you know what that means? We didn't want to live anymore. We would rather be dead. We'd rather be out of here. Now that's, folks, let me tell you something. Now, we can be all pretty about being a Christian if you like. But sometimes we need to admit, when you hit a, a road hard enough, you despair of waking up in the morning. And sometimes you'll prefer if he would just take you out. Well, that ain't true. If it ain't true, then why did Moses tell God, it's too much? You put too heavy a load on me. The load is too heavy. Moses basically told God, if you're going to treat me like this, just kill me. That was Moses, the great Moses. Elijah said, take my life. I'm not better than my forefathers. He sat under the juniper tree and prayed to die. That was Elijah. Jeremiah cried and said, I wish you would just forget all about me and wipe me out. And Job said, I wish somebody had killed the man that told my father a child is born. That's real life, y'all. When you get to life so rough, you're pressed beyond measure. You try to raise your hands and even if you do, you just raise them because I told you to, but there's no joy in your soul. There are tears in your eyes all the time and you, you wonder why you feel lonely and hurt and depressed and broken and you're pressed beyond measure so that if you don't wake up in the morning, that will be fine with you. I don't, I don't mean to be autobiographical, but some things are always on my mind. Yes, yes. Did you hear me? Yes. Every day of my life, every hour of my day, I don't care if I eat a meal. When I look in the plate, I see certain things. When I, when I oh my God, when I, when I get up in the morning, when I lie down, when I lay down at night, when I get dressed, when I'm undressed, when I'm in the shower, when I'm in my car, when I look at television, when I watch a movie, when I hear a conversation, some things are just always before me. I cannot escape it. It won't leave me. It bugs me. It bothers me. It's just right there. It's in my face. It's just, it's, I turn to the right. I turn, it's just, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Do you have something in your life? It's just there. It's just there. It won't leave you. And you really don't know what to do about it, but it, it's constantly with you. And sometimes it takes all the life out of you. And you feel like saying, if there's another place, I'll try that. Not that you're suicidal, but you feel like, well, maybe there's a better place than this. Or maybe somewhere the load lifts. Or you talk to a friend and you say, if this is God's vision, then what's holding it up? Has he forgotten me? Has God forsaken? Has God changed his mind? From the end of the earth, from the extremity. Now, if you had never been to the extremity, do your pastor a favor. Jot this lesson down. You don't need it tonight. You're going to need it. Paul Lawrence Dunbar said that he looked at life and said, a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in. Yes. Yes. A moment to laugh, but an hour to weep in. Mm -hmm. A pint of joy for a peck of trouble, and never comes the laughter, but the sorrow comes double. And that, said Dunbar, is life. 
Shakespeare put on the lips, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And sometimes you don't have to be philosophical or existential or whatever, but sometimes you wonder, does this thing make any sense? And you go through all of this just to die. So people can lie on you when you're alive and lie about you when you're dead and come to see you in a casket who didn't care about you when you were standing up. They ought to look up at you and say, hi, what you looking at? And if you take a picture of me in my casket, I am going to knock that camera out of your hand. I'm standing up here as cute as I want to be, looking fine as wine, and you ain't taking no picture now. And I'm lying in the casket, and people tell that lie, he looks so alive, he looks dead. <laughs> I'm only serious. Read. When my heart is overwhelmed. When my, get it, when my heart is distressed and overwhelmed. What, overwhelmed? When, when, when my heart just, oh, everything is going over my heart and, and it, my heart is breaking down and my emotions are overwhelmed and my whole self-life feels poured out. Read. Lead me. Uh-oh, uh uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, David said, huh. when all that happens, watch this. He didn't say, I want to find. See, that's where we get in trouble. We get in trouble when we keep looking for. But he said, Lord, what I'm into is so tough. Lead me. I, I'm getting happy by faith. Listen, he said, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness. He knows the way that I take. Lord, I don't need it. Listen, some of you are tired of wooden nickels. You tired of going down blind alleys. You tired of people lying to you. You're tired of blind alleys. You're tired of fake friends. You're tired of phony companions. You're tired of false hearts. Lead me to the rock. To the rock. A rock is solid. A rock doesn't move. A rock is not a mirage. A rock is not quicksand. To the rock. Tired of being disappointed. Tired of being let down. Tired of being lied to. Tired of blind alleys, tired of fake friends, tired of Judas. Lead me in the right direction. Plant my feet on a solid rock that's higher than I. Lead me above my situation. Won't he do it? Pull me up out of this. Change my situation. Give me a brand new start. Read. For thou hast been a shelter. For me. Ah, a shelter. You that is a protection for me. God, all around you. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What is the shadow of the Almighty? He's so big, he sits in heaven and puts his feet on the earth. What kind of shadow does God have? Uh, oh, the shadow. How wide is his shadow? How great is his shadow? Can't anything get through his shadow? I, I, I often try to cross General de Gaulle. And sometimes I'm trying to get across in rush hour traffic. But not too long ago, I had a good solution. Uh, I was at the corner and there was an 18-wheeler to my right. I was in the left lane. And I saw a lot of traffic coming. When I saw that 18-wheeler decide to go across the street, I just went in his shadow. And I said, I know that traffic is coming, but before it can hit me, it's got to hit that 18-wheeler. I live in the shadow. Things are not everything I need them to be, but I want to stay in the shadow. No, things are not all you want them to be. And when your heart is overwhelmed, get in the shadow. There's, there's protection. There's refuge. Read. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from my A from strong me. tower. That, that's, a, that's a military term. I just get up in that tower. Yes, yes. And all the trouble and woes and cares of life. Now let me tell you something. Sometimes <laughs> the Lord doesn't change the battle. Watch this. Or the issues 
or the, I, I'm not trying to teach. He's going to snap his finger and everything changes, but he'll put you in a secure place. But I'll tell you what, I've learned this. I've learned that I would rather be with Jesus in a storm than by myself on a sunny day. He's a refuge. Well, you don't need a refuge unless somebody's after you. You don't need a refuge unless you're in a battle. You don't need a, a high tower unless you need to get out. And listen, my prayer for you is that the Lord will bring an end to what you're going through. But if he doesn't, I want to be the kind of pastor to tell you how to survive until he brings you out. The thing I admire about this congregation is that of all my many mistakes, before Katrina, I did something right. Because you post-Katrina saints are holding on anyhow. I want to give you a faith that will, that believes and knows that God will bring you out of the water, but until, until. I want to give you a faith that can hold your faith in the water, knowing that he's your refuge and your fortress and your protection. That he's, listen, that he's not angry with you. That you're not being punished. That you're not under the wrath of God. That nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor life, nor death, nor any other creature. You're inseparable from God. You're God's child. He cannot abandon you. He will not abandon you. No man can pluck you out of his hand. You are secure in him. Never mind the storm. Never mind the situation. And that's a lot of never mind right there because some of our situations are nothing pretty to look at. But he's your refuge. That's what you have to understand. David had a way of talking about what he was going through, but he could switch so quickly to, but now, Lord, but after all of that, you, you, you lead me. You're my refuge. Read. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I, I will, see, see, we've got that scripture wrong, y'all. Uh, Psalm 23, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That doesn't mean that. Don't use that at the funeral. That doesn't mean that. That means length of days, not forever and ever and ever. That means I'm safe in the Lord's house. Do you remember when the psalmist said, uh, I had said Psalm 73, I'd almost fallen. Uh, when I, my feet had well and I slipped when I considered the wicked, they prospered and the wicked, the wicked prospered, the righteous suffered and I washed my hands in innocence. He said, until I went into the sanctuary. Uh -huh. Until I got with God. Until I saw things from God's perspective. That's what the sanctuary is for. That's why you need to be in church so you can get God's perspective on where you are. Oh, yeah. And not let the, your emotions or your situations dictate. Watch this. You cannot necessarily, listen to me now, change your situation, but you're not to let your emotions dictate how you feel about the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Do I need to say that again? Yeah. See, depression comes is when you let your emotions tell you how you feel about the situation. When you stand in God's word, you can say, I'm going through hell, but he knows the way that I take it. And after he's tried me, I'm coming out as pure gold. See the difference? So you got two choices. Come out as pure gold or jump off the bridge. You'll only jump off the bridge if you allow your emotions to dictate how you feel about the situation. But if you get filled with the word of God, he'll tell you, no, you hold on. Because the vision is yet for an appointed time. It will come and not be late. See the difference? Now I'm going to tell you something. David understood something I want you to understand. A part of our problem, a part of our situation has a divine purpose to it. And it is simply this. Only scarred hands heal. You cannot talk to, listen, listen. You cannot talk to a hurting world from a philosophical, theological, charismatic, smiling personality. God is good. Oh, just praise the Lord. It's going to be all right. All is well. Listen, listen. You go through death and resurrection so your witness will become genuine and authentic. People are hurting for real, y'all. And they don't need placebos and they don't need panaceas and they don't need superficial Christians who've never been through anything with their nursery rhymes and cute sayings. You can't help the broken until you have been broken. 
You can't help the down until you know what it means to be down. Why do you think when I pray for people with cancer, I pray and I get the blessed oil and I buke the devil and I buke death and I buke cancer cells and then I call for people who've had cancer. You missed it. They can pray at a whole nother level. I've never had chemo, I've never had radiation, never lost my hair, never been nauseated. So I can pray the prayer of faith, but I've never been there. He was at all points tempted like as we are. He was wounded. He knows our struggle. And you become an authentic witness when you've been broken. Old man Taylor says, God can fill only the place that has been emptied of the joys of this life. As long as we're holding on to some joy or something we think is real, even if it hurts us, God's going to keep on until you empty it out and recognize that all true joy, all true peace, and all true deliverance comes only from him. Yeah. Read. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Oh, I will trust in the covenant. Here we go again with those anthropomorphic references to God. A moment ago, I was under his shadow. Yes. Now, is that verse 4? That's verse 4. Read the rest of that verse. That's the end of the verse. Uh, all right, that, then I'm done. I'm done. The wings, I like that. Okay, now, all right, it's one thing to be under his shadow. Now I'm under, Lord have mercy. Now, that was a bird before, there was a prehistoric bird called a teratorn. A teratorn had a wingspan of something like 12 feet. And they say he cast a shadow over the earth. He looked like a small airplane. And you know, some eagles are pretty, pretty, pretty big. But here we go again. What kind of wings does God have? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. He will cover me with his feathers and under his wings. I know how rough life gets, but stay under his wing. I know sometimes hot tears fill your eyes and your road gets pretty lonely, but all people of God, you're under his wings. Oh, the wings of our mighty God, the wings of our holy and good God, the protection, the love, and the support. So even in these dark ages, even in this bad time, with all the issues that you're going through and all the things that are bothering you, I have good news for you. I'm talking about the wings, the protective wings. I'm under his protection. And the devil can't do but so much to me. I'm under his protection. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. I'm under his protection. He's already taken note of my steps. I can't go anywhere. He doesn't see me. In the dark, he sees where I am. Day and night are both alike to God. He can see just as well at the night as he can in the day. He holds my hand. He is still holding your hand. I don't care how much you're hurting. I don't care how bad you feel. Trouble in your marriage. Trouble in your finances. Trouble in your body. What makes you think God is not holding your hand? God is not a fair weather God. He's not just there when the sun is shining. God is always there. Never leaves. Never forsakes. You don't ever have to fear. Don't you despair. You may get tired and sit by the side of the road but get up and keep going. You may fall back but if you fall down get up and dust yourself out because one thing I know the righteous fall seven times but seven times they get back up. One thing I know now is him that's able to keep you from falling. Now I'm going to prophesy in 40 seconds that I'm going I'm leaving here. God is not a God of disappointment. God is not a God of disillusionment. God does not miss fire. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't blow bubbles. God doesn't make promises he cannot keep. God does not forsake his children. God is not a man that he should lie. He'll never leave you. He'll never let you down. He'll never disappoint you. He will bring you through. He will bring you out. He he will see you through. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The road is bound to smooth out. The night may be dark, but the morning is sure to come. Hold on. 